Hello everyone. The person I've chosen to profile for Black History Month this year is Bromley Armstrong. I chose Bromley because he meets the criteria of a Canadian Black pioneer who's the focus of our Black History Month this year. And I have a personal connection with Bromley, which I will explain later. Bromley Armstrong was a Canadian civil rights leader and a social activist for over six decades. He was influential in highlighting many injustices in our society and bringing about reforms to correct them. He was born in 1926 in Kingston, Jamaica and emigrated to Canada in 1947. His first encounter with racial discrimination and injustice was in his first job at the farm equipment manufacturer, Massey Harris, which later became Massey Ferguson. He was hired as a general laborer there, but he wanted to be a welder, like his father back in Jamaica. Well, they've never had a black welder at the plant and wasn't considered a job suitable for black persons. So his boss discouraged him from pursuing that position. But Romney wanted to, to do that. So he ignored the naysayers and signed up for classes to learn the trade. After he completed the training, he started to apply for welding jobs whenever they came up. And when he didn't get a response to any of his application, he asked the personnel department why, and they replied that they couldn't find his application. So he turned to his union for help. His union was a local chapter of the United Auto Workers, which later became the Canadian Auto Workers and still later Unifor. The union president at the time wondered why he should intervene to give, given that Mr. Armstrong had never been to a union meeting. Well, Bromley promised him that from then on, he will see him every month at every union meeting. And that's how Bromley first got involved with the union movement, in which he made a significant contribution over his career. He went on to become a shop steward and then a chief steward helping others and developing a reputation as a shrewd labor activist. He championed better working conditions for all, but he did have a focus on racial discrimination in the workplace. He worked with and was a good friend of Dennis McDermott, who later became the head of the Canadian Auto Workers, and someone who assisted John Bromley in many of his civil rights actions over the years. Dennis himself was forced to leave South Africa because of his association with black people there, so he was very sympathetic to Bromley's causes. Bromley branched out to help other unions in the Toronto District Labour Council. He gathered evidence to, of discrimination in businesses throughout the city. The list included restaurants, barbershops, and even churches. Bromley went on to champion the cause of equal rights for African Canadians, even outside the labour movement. Although racism was not officially entrenched in Canadian society in the 1950s, as it was in several US states, in many ways, its unofficial character made it more difficult to navigate. There may not have been any laws sanctioning discrimination, but there certainly weren't any laws banning the practice either. So in the early 1950s, Bromley led delegations to Queens Park advocating for legislation to end racial discrimination in the workplace and in organizations that provided services to the public. These actions eventually led the Leslie Frost government at the time to enact the Fair Employment Practices Act in 1951 and the Fair Accommodation Practices Act in 1954. After these legislations became law, compliance was not universal across the province. So the fight wasn't over. Toronto was resistant to change, but small town Ontario was even further behind. And nowhere was that more evident than in the small Southwest Ontario town of Dresden. Now, many of you here at St. Mike's know of Dresden. It has a lot of history for the black community here in Ontario. Our men's fellowship group ran a bus trip there several years ago. It is located close to the US border. And in the 19th century, Dresden was the home of Josiah Hansen, who inspired the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. 
It was also the terminus of the legendary Underground Railroad, which brought refugees from enslavement in the United States to the promise of freedom in Canada. However, there was a sad part to the Dresden story. Once a beacon of hope for the Black people, it turned into a bastion of racism by the end of the Second World War. In the early 1950s, Blacks, <coughs> who were mostly descendants of escaped slaves, constituted close to 20% of Dresden's inhabitants, but was very segregated. And several of the town's restaurants, barbershops, and other institutions refused to serve Black people. So in an attempt to test enforcement of the new laws, Bromley and a Chinese Canadian friend of his went to Dresden to have a meal at a restaurant known to bar Blacks. He brought along some media folks from Toronto with their cameras and reporters to witness and record what was about to happen. But he had them stay, up, stay back a bit when he first entered the restaurant. So after waiting for about 20 minutes to be served in a nearly empty restaurant, he summoned some of the media people to enter. And they sat at another table and were promptly attended to. To hear Bromley describe the incident himself, I'll show you a clip from the National that revisited the incident on its 60th anniversary. To go through that, it made you feel like you're nothing. It made you feel like you were not even a second class citizen, that you were a citizen, you were not a human being. This week, we've been examining the issue of racism in Canada. And tonight, we want to take you to a small community in southwestern Ontario to look back at a moment in history. 60 years ago, a small group sat down in a restaurant in Dresden and made a big difference. Nick Purton joined two of that group as they revisited the community and a civil rights victory. Bromley Armstrong and his old friend Ruth Laura Malloy are searching for a restaurant. Halfway down it was Mackay's and then further down it was on the A restaurant where they made history. No, it was bigger than that. A restaurant that back in 1954 wouldn't serve black people. It doesn't really matter that the restaurant isn't here anymore. What matters is what Bromley and Ruth did here. That's disappeared two times. Yep. Okay, they think Mackay's was back here. Mackay's where? Where the eye doctor is now. How do we see eye doctor here? I don't see an eye doctor. Oh, we passed it then. And that things in Dresden and across the country have changed. Right here. In part because of them. Looking inside, I could recognize it's the same place. Bring back memories. What kind of memories? Memories of being refused even a cup of coffee. That was the reality for people of color all across the country. If you can't imagine it, have a look at this. Dresden is a small place, 2,000 people, about 12% color. But there are just nine business establishments in town that refuse service to colored people. Why? Dresden, Ontario, the site of Uncle Tom's Cabin, a spot along the Underground Railroad, and a battleground for the civil rights movement in Canada, led locally by this man. Mr. Burnett, a carpenter and secretary of the National Unity Association, would you say that uh, racial discrimination is a recent thing in Dresden? I wouldn't say it's too recent. It's been going on for over 100 years, or around 100 years. And it's been as bad you know, as long as I can remember as it is now. You can't force anybody to, to, to serve anybody at any time. Many people seem to think so. If they continue, there will be civil war in Canada and spread on themselves. Yeah, this, be the, the, this, is the, this is the showdown. Tensions were high. A new anti-discrimination law had just passed in Ontario, but nothing had changed. Even when activists set up stings at businesses to prove racism. Enter Bromley and Ruth. They did something different. When they went to the restaurant that day in October of 1954, they brought along a reporter to bear witness and tell the story. Were you served or were you not served? No. 
I wasn't served because we were together. If the I had, reporter was served. The reporter was served. He was separate. And I different so we were all watching mm -hmm. as if they didn't know you. Yeah. You know? Nobody approached us. I got out. I went across to the waitress standing there like a mannequin. And I says, good afternoon. Um, is it possible to get some service? I'd like to have a coffee and something to eat. She never batted an eyelid. And I finally said to her, um, is there a manager? Could I see the manager? And she went, in other words, the manager was at the bar. I went to the bar and that was Mr. Okay. He was over a butcher block with a meat cleaver in his hand. Chop, 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 chop. And he started, you could see that his countenance was changing, like the blood was getting up into his head and into his face. And he started chopping faster and faster and faster with nothing on the, on the, on the, on the butcher block. Then I got to the point and I said, don't push your luck because you, you never know. And I went back to the table because we have had all the evidence we needed then. Bromley and Ruth's bravery did become national news. The restaurant owners were convicted, they paid a fine, and Canada took an important step toward racial equality. That, to me, was the defining point in, in this whole struggle, that a group of just individuals like Ruth, Laura, and myself got involved in something that changed the whole history of Ontario and, and to make us all feel equal. It became one of the highlights of my life, one of the best achievements I think I've done with my life. We have finally reached not the end of the road, but the beginning of changing life for people like ourselves. Nick Purden, CBC News, Dresden, Ontario. That Dresden story received prominent coverage in Toronto newspapers and ultimately propelled the Ontario Premier to publicly affirm the province's commitment to the new anti-discrimination law. It also contributed to the establishment of the Ontario Human Rights Commission in 1961, and was, which was the first organization of its kind in Canada and one of the first human rights commission in the world. The incident in Dresden also got some play in the United States where it prompted similar actions in some jurisdictions south of the border. Bromley organized other sit-ins and rent-ins and other protest actions too, too numerous for me to list right now as I try to keep this a little shorter. But in general, Bromley fought against anything that he thought was unjust, unfair, or unequal. And not all of it was race-related. He was committed to community-based social activism. He founded and helped many organizations, including the Jamaica Canadian Association, the Black Business and Professional Association, the Urban Alliance and Race Relations, the Canadian Ethnocultural Council, and many others. He also served on the newly formed Ontario Human Rights Commission, the Ontario Labor Relations Board, the Toronto Mayor's Committee on Community and Race Relations, the Ontario Advisory Council on Multiculturalism, and the Board of Governors for the Canadian Centre for Police Race Relations. His activism eventually led to the formation of the Special Investigations Unit, the Ontario Police Watchdog. One of the many incidents that I can mention briefly was when he was an adjudicator on the Ontario Labor Relations Board and, and his fellow adjudicators asked him to recruit himself from a case before the board on account that the complainant was black and there might be a perception of bias. Well, Bromley replied, re agreed to recruit himself so long as all his fellow adjudicators also agreed to recruit himself from all other cases before the board. I think he made his point. In the 1970s, Romney published a newspaper called The Islander. However, repeated threats against the paper and a campaign of harassment against Mr. Armstrong led to the demise of the paper. But it also led eventually to the arrest of 
a group of white supremacists that were charged with harassing Mr. Armstrong. Romney received many awards and distinction over the years. Amongst them, he was named to the Order of Ontario, the Order of Canada, and to the Order of Distinction of Jamaica. In 2013, Mr. Armstrong received an honorary Doctors of Law degree from York University for his demonstrated dedication, passion, and lifelong commitment to the battle against racism. I mentioned at the outset that I have, I have a connection with Romney Armstrong. Romney and my father were good friends, and they were both founding members in 1962 of the Jamaica Canadian Association. And through his association with my father, I've known Romney ever since I arrived in Canada in 1960. I have a personally autographed copy of his uh, autobiography. Romney was at my father's funeral in 2012, and many of you at St. Michael's were also at that funeral and may have come across him there. My mother and I visited Romney in his home in Pickering when he was in failing health and we were at his funeral in 2018. So I'm speaking with some inside knowledge of a very inspiring black pioneer in Canada. And I hope that I was able to enlighten you somewhat with the story. Thank you. Andre de Grasse, printer born November 10th, 1994 in Scarborough, Ontario. Well, Donovan Bailey was the first Canadian to run under 10 seconds in the 100 meter dash. The grass is the first to break both the 10 second barrier in the 100 meter dash and the 20 second barrier in the 200 meter dash at age 20. The grass burst onto the international stage, winning double gold on, at the 2015 Pan Am Games in, Ontario, in Toronto, Ontario, following by a uh, bronze medal in the 100 meter at the 2015 World Track and Field Competition. He is the Canadian 200 meter record holder at the 2016 Olympic Summer Games in Rio. The grass won three medals, silver in the 200 meter, bronze in the 100 meter, and bronze in the four by 100 meter relay. After graduating, from Millican Mills in 2012, DeGrasse attended Coffeyville Community College in Coffeyville, Kansas from 2012 to 2014. Coffeyville, like other junior colleges, it was known for its athletic program and it's generally considered a track and field powerhouse. Many students, athletes being their careers, at junior or, co or community college, and then transfer to major colleges at Coffeyville. The grass won five J and JCAA titles, including the 200 meter dash title and the 100 meter title. 